Hi, welcome to Why the Book Wins. My name is Laura and today's video is part of a series I do where I compare books with their movie adaptations and through these videos I discuss why the majority of the time when it comes to the book versus movie, the book wins. Now having said that, I enjoy watching movies just as much as I enjoy reading books, like I love both. So I do give like unbiased reviews of both book and movie, I think for the most part. But I also wanted to let you know that this is available as a podcast. And so these tend to be about 30 minutes long, but especially for ones that go over that, if it just works better for you to listen to it as a podcast, they are available. So just search why the book wins and whatever podcasting platform you use. I will also link to them down below for Spotify and Google Podcast. Or sorry, for a Spotify and Apple podcast because those are the ones most people use. So yeah, if you would rather do that, those are available too. And before we get into this video, I do want to say that there will be spoilers for both the book and the movie. So if you plan on reading the book or watching the movie and do not want it spoiled, then go do that first and then come back and watch this video. Without further ado, let's get right into today's video. Hi, welcome to Why the Book Wins. My name is Laura and today I'm here to talk about Deep Water, which is a novel written by Patricia Highsmith, published in 1957. And then the movie Deep Water was released March 18th, 2022, which hopefully will be yesterday. I'm planning on releasing this video Saturday. Anyway, it was directed by Adrian Lynn, or Line. I keep wanting to say Lynn, but I believe it's pronounced Line. And Patricia Highsmith, she has a, written a number of famous novels a lot of which have been turned into movies. We have Strangers on a Train, which was her first novel she ever wrote, and it was adapted by Alfred Hitchcock. And then she also wrote The Talented Mr. Ripley, which was adapted into a movie starring Matt Damon, Jude Law, and Gwyneth Paltrow. And she also wrote the novel Carol, which was adapted into a movie recently with Kate Blanchett and Rooney Mara. Although she wrote Carol under a pseudonym, I believe. And to give a summary of this, we have Vic and Melinda, who are a married couple. They have been together for, you know, over 10 years, it sounds like. And they have a young daughter named Trixie. We find out in the book that a couple years after Trixie's birth, Melinda tells Vic that she's just no longer interested in him romantically, intimately. And soon after this, she starts having these affairs with one guy after another, usually men that are just in town temporarily and then they leave and once they leave, she finds someone new. And she also flaunts these affairs around town and is very flirty with these men in public and is not really trying to hide it. And Vic apparently is just silently putting up with this and acts like he's not bothered, even though he is, but around his friends, he acts like it, he's not bothered by it. And then one night they go to a pool party and Melinda brings her latest guy along. And at one point during the night, Vic and this guy, Charlie, are left alone in the pool and Vic ends up killing him. Right away, Melinda accuses Vic. However, Vic is respected and well liked by everybody in the community. And so everybody else is like, because no one saw him do it, obviously. And so everybody else is like, what? It was just an accident. But Melinda doesn't believe it was an accident. And she and this other guy named Don Wilson think that Vic did kill him. And Don Wilson is new in town though. And so nobody really trusts his opinion because they're like, you just moved here, what do you know? Whereas Vic has lived there for like eight years and people know him really well, or at least they think they do. So Melinda is publicly accusing him all around town for a while. However, similar to his the affairs she was having, he just silently puts up with it and doesn't try to stop her. And then before long, Melinda finds a new guy that she starts to have an affair with. And then once again, Vic gets himself alone with this guy and he kills him. Melinda once again accuses Vic and assumes he must have done it. However, Vic denies it. And then as time goes on, Melinda, it seems like she's over it and she's being nice to Vic and she's no longer talking to Don, the other guy who accuses Vic. And so it seems like things are fine. And then Vic ends up returning to the scene of the crime though, where he had killed the second guy. And then Don, he finds Vic there and sees Vic acting suspiciously. And from here, the book and movie are different. So as far as the details of the end, I will save that for later, but that's the basic summary and premise of the book and movie. So onto the book review portion. I did really enjoy this book. I would definitely recommend it to anybody who loves like the suburban thrillers about, you know, a married couple whose toxic relationship ends up leading to murder in one way or another. And it's also one of those stories about an unhealthy relationship where the two people are both messed up in their own ways. And so they just kind of belong together, right? And it like they just go together because who else would put up with them, you know? And Patricia Highsmith seems to have put a bit of herself in both of these characters, Melinda and Vic because similar to Melinda, Patricia Highsmith was an alcoholic who would just kind of stir up drama when she was at public gatherings. And then similar to Vic, she liked, she preferred being alone. And she also kept and bred hundreds of snails. 
And she was also in like into woodworking, which in the book we learned that Vic is into that. And Vic in general just has a lot of hobbies. And it seems like Kai Smith as well just had a lot of hobbies and preferred being alone. And she also never had a relationship last longer than a couple of years. And Vic and Melinda, they have a relationship that has lasted, but it's definitely not the healthiest. I did feel like the book moved a bit slow at times, which you could say it moved at a snail's pace, <laughs> pun intended. Actually, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't a snail's pace. I just wanted to get that pun in there. But it did feel a little slow at times, I will say. Having said that, I was curious how things would end up. And I guessed what would happen, but I had my guesses, but I was unsure of myself. However, I did end up being right. So that was kind of, we'll talk about the ending when we get there, of course, but I, have, I still don't quite know what I think of the ending of either book or movie. And I did love the beginning of this book, which this is in like early on in the movie as well, where we see Vic telling Melinda's latest conquest that he had killed a previous guy who had been friends with Melinda and how it's a lie and he, it's this rumor he is purposefully starting. And so it just gives you a look into the kind of guy Vic is. And while I'm talking about McRae real quick, I'll talk about a change from book to movie with this because in the movie McRae, he's just, he's gone missing and people don't know what happened to him. Vic tells Joel, this is, Joel is her latest conquest. Anyway, Vic tells him, that he killed him with a hammer. However, later on, we see the news turned on and they say they found McRae's body and he had been shot. And so that's the movie's way of telling us that it was a lie and Vic didn't actually do it. Because the movie didn't straight up say it was a lie, like we were left to guess, until that news report comes on and we see it was a lie. However, in the book, McRae's body was found in his apartment and so people knew he was dead. And so Vic tells them that he was the one who killed them. However, eventually a newspaper article shows who the real killer was because he was found, much to Vic's disappointment. And once that news article comes out, Melinda starts seeing men again, because when this rumor was spreading around, people believed it. And so Melinda was on her best behavior and she wasn't seeing other men. But then when the real news came out, she started going back to her old ways. And with the movie, so after reading the book, I had high expectations for the movie. Then I watched the trailer and that lowered my expectations and I was worried it wasn't gonna be what I wanted it to be. But thankfully, the movie was better than my lowered expectations, so that was a pleasant surprise. Ben Affleck and Anna de, Ar Anna, Anna de Armas were great as Vic and Melinda. I thought they were perfectly cast and I just loved the scenes with the two of them together, especially like their back and forth, which <laughs> It's not like a cute repartee they have, like it's a bad relationship, you know, like when she's at dinner with the detective and she's like, does that make my husband a psychopath that he asks you that? And he's like, does my wife have schizophrenic tendencies? And just the way they're acting around each other in this very unhealthy way was very entertaining and I enjoyed it. Quick aside, this is the third Affleck movie I have talked about. So if you're a fan of Ben Affleck, I also have a book first movie for Gone Girl and The Tender Bar. If you wanna check those out, I will link to them. Anyway, back to Deep Water. I also really enjoyed Grace Jenkins as Trixie, their daughter. The very first scene we see her in, we can see right away that she has a bond with Vic, her dad, and that she likes to annoy her mom and that her mom doesn't really seem to like her. And so you instantly see the relationship that's going on here. And Jenkins herself was just really cute. And I thought she was a great child actress. And the cinematography for this movie was really beautiful as well. There were some great shots. And as I was watching this, I was surprised that it was a Hulu streaming release and not in theaters. So I still am a little confused by that. Which by the way, the director, Adrian Lyne, he's directed a lot of well-known movies. This is his first in 20 years, but he directed Fatal Attraction, Jacob's Ladder, Flashdance, just to name a few. And then the cinematographer is, I'm gonna mess his name up, but it's like Eigel Beerlid. I don't, I'm, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, but he is the cinematographer who also did In Bruges, which is a great movie from 2008. And I was recently on a podcast called The Forgotten Cinema Podcast, where we talked about In Bruges. So I will link to that as well, if you want to hear a discussion about the movie In Bruges. And then to get into the story and the differences, I'm going to start talking about Vic. So in both book and movie, Vic really prides himself on being different than other people. And in the book, there's this whole scene where he's talking to Trixie, their daughter, about not conforming to what everybody else is doing. And we see how Melinda is bothered by him in a lot of ways and how he is different. And there is a great scene in the movie when they're at dinner with Joel, that guy who he had lied to about killing Gordon, or not Gordon, uh, Martin McRae. They invite him over to dinner and she says something about how sometimes it like worries her or it bothers her how Vic isn't normal. And then Vic replies like, if I was normal, we wouldn't have Joel here right now. <laughs> And that whole dinner scene was fantastic. Also, when Joel first shows up, Vic answers the door and he's talking as if it's just gonna be the two of them at dinner, which obviously would be uncomfortable. And then he's like, oh, I'm just kidding, Melinda is here. And yeah, I loved all of that. I thought it was hilarious and very entertaining. And 
again, one of those scenes where the chemistry between Ben Affleck and Anna Darmus just with their, you know, their barbs at each other <laughs> was, was fantastic and I really enjoyed it. But in both, he seems to, you know, just silently putting up with Melinda's affairs and he doesn't seem to mind people bringing it up to him, like his friends and people in the community, because he says how, you know, like, you know, I'm not going to try to control her, you know, what can I do? And it makes him seem like this long suffering husband who loves his wife so much that he's willing to put up with what she's doing to him. And in the movie, we do see his friends talking to him about how like, your wife shouldn't be flaunting this around town, you need to do something. And they also go to a lot of parties and social functions. So it is shown in the movie, but it was even more so in the book. Like he has a close friend named Horace in the book and Horace is the one who is often being like, you gotta do something about Melinda. And in the movie, the character of Horace is instead named Grant and he is played by Little Ray Howery. And he isn't, that character definitely is not in as much of the movie as Horace was in the book, because Horace was a fairly big character in the book. He was often around and talking to Vic and whatever. And in the movie, Vic is rich because he created this computer chip that can go in drones that can like find people and it's used for bombing, like in wars, drone war or something like that. Whereas in the book, he actually inherited his money. So his dad got rich off something. And so Vic just has all this money. However, he does have a printing press or like a publisher, a publishing company, a very small publishing company. And so he does do that, but really he's just getting his money from his inheritance. The movie does show though that as in the book, Vic has a lot of hobbies and the movie does show that, you know, printing magazines and poems and stuff is one of the hobbies that he does do. And one line from the book, just showing the kind of person Vic is and how he isn't a normal person, not bothered by what someone would be <laughs> bothered by. And also showing just how he has so many things he enjoys doing. The quote reads, the rest of what the psychiatrist had told Vic about the intolerable situation and of his heading for a divorce, all that only inspired Vic to prove him wrong. He would show the psychiatrist and the world that, that the situation was not intolerable and that there would be no divorce. Neither was he going to be miserable. The world was too full of interesting things. And in the book and movie, we see that Keeping snails is a huge hobby, one of his like main hobbies. And as I said, Highsmith herself kept and bred snails. Yeah, the snails are a big part of the book and I was worried that the movie would leave them out because it is kind of weird and random. However, I was so happy to see that they kept that in. And Vic, so he loves his snails and he's very attached to them, like more attached to these snails than he is to his own wife. Like he's attached to Trixie, his daughter, but he's definitely not attached to Melinda very much. And he's more attached to these snails and snails like don't have, like they're not male or female, but he does have these two main snails that breed and he gives them a male and female name. And sex is alluded to in the book with Melinda's affairs, but the only sex scene we get is between these two snails when Vic is watching them. He talks about how like he loathes human touch, specifically like there's a scene where Melinda touches him and then he's thinking how he loathed her touch. And then he goes and he sees these snails and he sees that they're mating and he is like, he feels more emotion about seeing these snails <laughs> than he does about his wife. And kind of seeing as these snails as having a truer love, truer romance than he and his wife have. And the movie also includes the line where it says how the snail will climb a 12 foot wall to get to his mate. And that could be seen again as him like romanticizing these snails and what they have and what they're willing to do for each other. But then it could also be symbolic of Vic seeing himself as a snail who's willing to climb a 12 foot wall for Melinda. I feel like that applies more to the movie though because in the movie, I think he was genuinely, we'll get into it, but I think he was more jealous and loved Melinda more in the movie. Whereas in the book, it was a little different. And then with Vic and Melinda, as I said in the book, it says multiple times that he loathes human touch. Like Melinda touches him and it says that he loathes it. And then another time someone else like grabs his arm and it says the same thing. Whereas in the movie, this isn't the case because they do have sex in the movie. So that's a big change right there. And in both book and movie, Vic says how he has no interest in trying to control Melinda, which is why he just doesn't interfere with her affairs and her public flirting. But then in the movie, he is jealous and as they say in the movie, as Melinda says in the movie, like he killed for her because he was so jealous and because he loved her so much. But in the book, his feelings for Melinda are described as a combination of loathing and devotion. And when his friends talk bad about her in the book, he gets very defensive. And yet at the same time, <laughs> he really dislikes her in certain ways. So it seems like his feelings are more complicated in the book, whereas in the movie, they're complicated, but I think he had a weird kind of love for her more so in the movie than he did in the book. And in the movie, he was still sexually attracted to her, whereas in the book, he was not. And in the movie, she tells him like, you know, if you were with someone else, you would be so bored. And so he seems to like this toxic relationship he has with her, 
because it keeps it interesting, right? And this is never directly stated in the book. And in the book, I don't know if jealousy was really his reason for killing Charlie and then later Tony. It might have been more like that she was making a fool out of him by flaunting it in front of everybody. So maybe that got to his to his pride more so, and maybe that was really the reason. But he also tells her how the men she picks are always like such idiots, and <laughs> he just wants her to pick someone who has a brain. And to talk about Charlie Delisle, so in book and movie, his death wasn't something that was planned, it just kind of happened. And in the book, it talks about how when he started the rumor about killing McRae, how it felt like a release for him, and he felt like more freedom, or more free. However, when it was found out, you know, that the real killer was found, then he's just started getting all these pent up emotions again. And so, you know, that led to him killing Charlie. And then once again, he felt this release. In book and movie, Vic definitely seems to have some psychopathic tendencies, like not showing emotion and just keeping it bottled up and not showing it. And then it comes out in these huge acts, you know, these sudden bursts. Which, by the way, in the movie, Ben Affleck, Vic, he spends a lot of the movie just like glowering. And it came to a point where when it showed him making that face, I would kind of chuckle because it happened so much. It's just constant throughout the movie. But anyway, in the movie, we don't see Vic killing Charlie. And so, f you know, for like five minutes, we're left to wonder. However, it is soon revealed that he is the one who did it. So it's a pretty short window <laughs> where we're left wondering. But in the book, we see it happening as it happens. So the movie didn't do that. And in book and movie, there is an inquest and everybody says that they believe it was an accident, except for Melinda, who's like, no, Vic did it. But as I said, Vic has been living in this community for eight years now and is very admired and trusted. And nobody is believing Melinda, aside from this guy, Don. But again, no one believes him either because he's new in town. But it does get to the point in the book where Don and his wife end up moving to a different town <laughs> because of these accusations they have against Don and the community is like not, not down for him to be accusing Vic. And eventually he ends up moving. And after Charlie's death, Melinda starts bringing another guy around and he claims to be a psychotherapist. Vic doesn't think it's one of her conquests and he's kind of suspicious about what this guy is about. And at one point he has his friend Horace over and Horace is chatting with this guy. And later on, Horace is like, you know, there's something fishy about that guy because he claims to work at this health center. But then when I asked him about different people who work there, he didn't know anybody. And then later, Vic sees Don and this other guy walking on the street. And so Vic approaches them and he's like, I know you hired this detective with Melinda. What agency did you use? And being very aggressive. And at this point in the book, we don't know for sure if this guy is even a detective or not. So as I was reading this, I was like, Vic is just coming across crazy and paranoid. And we're going to find out that the guy's not even a detective. However, that's not what happened. <laughs> Turns out he is a detective and Don breaks under the pressure and he admits it and he's like, yes, he's a detective and this is the agency we used. And I thought that was a great scene because going into it, you're not sure if, like I said, if Vic is going to come across crazy and paranoid or if he's going to be right. And he was right. So it was kind of, I don't know, like a cool moment because there is, you know, something weird about this book and movie is that you're rooting for Vic, even though he's not a good person. <laughs> But nonetheless, he was right and it was a detective. And so he calls the agency and he tells them to get rid of this guy. Whereas in the movie, so he sees the guy hanging around Melinda and then he later goes to Don's house. So he intrudes on their dinner and accuses him. However, Don never straight up says that it is. Like the movie strongly implies that he really was a detective. Like it, there doesn't seem to be too much question. However, Don doesn't directly admit it the way he did in the book. And to talk about Trixie real fast. So Vic, like I said, he definitely loves Trixie and is very proud of her. And the scenes in the movie between Trixie and Vic, I loved. I thought they just had a really cute bond and I just love seeing them together in their scenes. And in the book, Trixie comes home and she's asking him, you know, she's saying that kids at school are telling her that her dad killed Charlie and they're asking her how he did it. And so she's asking him like, how did you do it? That way I can tell them. And he's like, you know, I didn't do that. And if I did, I would go to jail for a really long time. And she kind of looks at him like conspiratorially, conspiratorially. Uh, and she's like, I think you did do it, but you're just telling me you didn't. And the way she says it, he can see that like she wants to believe he did it. And because she's so young, she doesn't realize the seriousness of this. And it, instead, she just thinks it's cool and she's proud of it. And so that scene is shown in the movie. And again, it was a great scene. And Jenkins was so cute and amazing as Trixie with that look she gives him when she's talking to him about this. 
And we also see in book and movie how Melinda doesn't like being a mom and doesn't really like being around Trixie and is easily annoyed by her. And in the book, we learn that she was super back and forth about having kids before finally being like, okay, let's do it. And then as I said, shortly after Trixie is born is when she's just like no longer interested in Vic. Whereas in the movie, Vic at one point brings up Trixie and she's like, having a kid was your idea, not mine, basically. And also in the book, we learned that when Vic and Melinda were dating, like she didn't want to get married and Vic had to work to tie her down essentially. But again, he doesn't want to tie her down because he doesn't want to try to control her. But we see how right from the start, she was this free spirit who didn't even really want to get married. And then once they were married, she didn't really even want to have kids, but she kind of is going through the motions regardless. And in the book, Melinda is accusing Vic like for a long time. <laughs> I feel like in the movie they didn't quite show this, but after Charlie, she's just constantly talking about it to everybody. And she and Don are kind of forming their anti-Vic group, but no one is like putting any stock in what they say. And so people just see it as just like more that Vic is having to put up with, with Melinda. And there, at one point when he's talking about or like thinking about the detective, there's a line where Vic thinks, if it transpired that Carpenter was a detective, Vic could say that he realized it all along and that it didn't bother him. And it would be particularly gallant attitude to display in regard to Melinda, his wife, who had hired the detective against him. And this line is funny because he's thinking by not being bothered that his wife hired a detective, that it'll be gallant to see that he's not bothered by this. And it's like, by thinking it's gallant? By not being bothered... By thinking it's gallant to act like you're not bothered is not normal because it's not gallant. Like that's not a normal thing to not be bothered. And it's not gallant to not be bothered either. Like you should be bothered. And so just seeing what Vic thinks is normal, right? When it's not normal, kind of showing his personality disorder. In the movie, after the inquest, it seems like Melinda moves on pretty quickly to hanging out with Tony Cameron, where in the, in the book, like I said, it took a bit more time. And like I said, the movie really plays up the whole, like, we're so terrible, we both belong to each other kind of a thing, especially with the ending, which we will get to. But in the movie, we see that he, she likes that he has killed for her. And he is also just like drawn to her personality and like just the way she is. And the movie did show about how she was just a magnetic person and very charismatic. Like when it shows her playing the piano, when she's drunk playing the piano, and yet it should be embarrassing, but she's actually just so charismatic that everybody's enjoying it. And then later when she's playing the game with like the drink on her back and it's just, she's just fun to be around. So the movie did do a good job showing that. And even Vic is not immune to her charisma in either book or movie, but especially the movie. Cause I think she was more charismatic in the movie than she was in the book. In the book, like we do kind of see this about how they're so terrible they belong together because there's a part where he offers to give her a divorce and how he'll give her a good amount of money. And she's like, mm, no, I'm not done with you yet. So that thing about staying together, even though it's a bad, unhealthy relationship and they don't actually love each other. And in the movie, after the inquest, it seems like she moves on pretty quickly to Tony Cameron, where in, in the book, like more time had passed. But in the movie, we find out that Tony is someone she had known like long ago and had dated. Whereas in the book, he was a brand new guy in town. And in both book and movie, he's a contractor. And in the book, we learn that after he's done here, he's gonna be doing a job in Mexico. In the book, they've only known each other for a few months, but they go to a party. Vic had backed out at the last minute, so only Melinda and Tony go to this party. And Melinda, Horace tells Vic later that Melinda was drunkenly telling everybody, Tony has a second ticket for Mexico and I'm gonna go with him. And then as seen in the movie, they have Tony over for dinner. And while he's there for dinner is like when they suggest eating the snails for dinner, which of course, as said in the book, eating the snails would be like Vic, you know, eating his own family essentially because he's so attached to them. And he shuts it down in both book and movie by telling them like, you have to starve snails for three days before you eat them, otherwise you'll get poisoned. And he does it in just this very stoic way in both book and movie. And then in both book and movie, he picks up Tony in his car when he sees him walking in town. And then in the movie, he drives him to a gorge in the forest, whereas in the book, he drove him to a quarry. But in both book and movie, he hits him with a rock and then he like ties boulders to Tony's body to get him to float down in the water. And then he tries to convince Melinda that Tony just left town without her and that he lost interest in her and just abandoned her. And police obviously get involved because Melinda, of course, right away, she assumes Vic killed him. And police get involved and he tries to get the police to believe that too, that Tony just skipped town. And nothing ends up really happening with the police, at least not at that point, but Melinda believes that Vic did it. So in the book, 
After Tony disappears, at one point, Melinda just starts to be nice (laughs) to Vic. And she's no longer talking to Don, it doesn't seem. And she's no longer, you know, accusing Vic in private or in public. And in fact, she goes to their friends and apologizes to them for what she had said about Vic. And Vic, like, he likes that she's being nice, but he's also being like, why, what is she up to? And she even calmly asks him, being like, you know, just tell me that you did it. I already believe you did do it, so you admitting it isn't going to change anything. But he still, he won't confess. And then at one point, they go on a picnic to the quarry, because this is the book, and in the book, it's the quarry. And the quarry was a common place they would go to picnic. And while they're there, Vic thinks he sees Tony's body. And so... They're leaving, and once they're home, Melinda is like, oh, I forgot my scarf there. And so Vic quickly is like, oh, I'll go get it tomorrow. That way he can also go check on the body. However, later in the evening, Melinda's on the phone, and then she tells Vic, she's like, oh, you don't need to get my scarf tomorrow. Never mind, someone else is going to get it. However, Vic goes nonetheless, and while he is down there, he sees that it was just rocks and it wasn't even Tony's body anyway. However, he does see blood on the granite, and so he's trying to scuff it with his shoes, And while he's doing that, Don appears and he has Melinda's scarf because he is the one that Melinda was going to be seeing the next day. And so she had asked him to get her scarf. And he just happens to see Vic when he's there. And Vic is acting very odd. And Vic quickly, you know, is like, well, I got to go. And he gets in the car and drives off. Meanwhile, Don is like, you know, that was blood down there. And I know Vic did it. And so he chases after Vic. Vic returns home and he sees Melinda on the phone. And she's kind of, uh, you know, all frazzled. And Vic, for the first time, he shows his temper in front of Melinda and he grabs the phone out of the wall. And then he proceeds to choke Melinda and she dies. And while this is happening, Don shows up with the police and they take Don away. The police take Don away and that's the end of the book. Whereas in the movie, so they go on a picnic to the gorge. And as in the book, Melinda starts being nice and seems to enjoy being around Vic. But this is different from the book because in the book, Vic was suspicious and we, the reader, were also suspicious. Whereas in the movie, she seems genuinely happy around Vic and enjoys being around him. And Vic also is not suspicious in the movie and he's just enjoying it. Once again, showing how in the movie, he seems to truly care about her and love her more so than he had in the book. And also showing that Melinda also loves and cares about him more in the movie as well. But again, you know, it's kind of a weird relationship, even though they do seem to care about each other. And we see Vic giving her this photo book he had made for her, for her, and she is genuinely touched by it. And he, you know, they have this sweet moment where they seem to really care and love about love each other. Again, he sees what he thinks is the body. Again, they go home. She says she forgot the scarf. He says he'll go get it. The next morning, he goes to the gorge. And in the movie, it really was Tony's body. So he gets the stick to try to get it back. And while he's doing that, Don shows up showing that he has Melinda's scarf. And he's like, what are you doing down there? Like, what's with the stick? And so he tries to get a bit closer. And as he gets closer, he sees Tony. And he's like, what? Like, I knew it. I knew you were the killer. And he goes up and drives off. And he's in a car, but Vic is on his bike. But Vic cuts through the forest and he cuts Don off. And it causes Don to drive off a cliff. And Don dies in the movie. Meanwhile, while this is happening, Melinda is looking for Vic and she's in his snail area. And then she sees a wallet in one of the snail tanks. She takes it out and she sees that it's Tony's wallet because Vic had removed it. So obviously she knows that Tony is dead. We see Vic return home and Melinda's looking at him and she tells him, I found Tony. And then she walks off and we see a flashback that when she found the wallet, she burned it. So the ending, and that's the end. (laughs) So very different endings. And I do think the movie has a more modern take on the end with this being like, with this being the toxic relationship where they choose to stay in it rather than things, you know, kind of exploding in the way they did in the book. This book was written in the 1950s and I heard that Patricia Highsmith wasn't appreciated in her time. And I think that makes sense because I feel like this story just really appeals to our modern day sensibilities. And then the ending of the movie, I think they modernized it even more. And like I said, when I was reading the book, I suspected that it would end with Melinda dying and something big like that. However, I was hoping that it would go in a different way that I wasn't guessing. But then what I suspected ended up happening. And so I I don't know. I don't don't know how I feel about the book or movie ending. Like the book ending was kind of too typical. But then the movie ending just seemed like a rip off of other suburban thrillers like this with unhealthy relationships. So maybe the movie ending would have been more unique had I not seen other movies that have a similar vibe. But then the book just seemed too stereotypical too, having her die in the end. Although the book does have this line, 
as he's being taken away by the police, and it reads, But Melinda is dead and so am I, he thought. Then he knew why he felt empty, because he had left his life in the house behind him, his guilt and his shame, his achievements and failures, the failure of his experiment, and his final brutal gesture of petulant, petulant revenge. He looked at Wilson, Don Wilson, walking beside him, still intoning of tedious information and feeling very calm and happy. Vic kept looking at Wilson's wagging jaw and thinking of the multitude of people like him on Earth. Perhaps half the people on Earth were of his type, or potentially his type, and thinking that it would not be bad at all to be leaving them. The ugly birds without wings, the mediocre who perpetuated mediocrity, who really fought and died for it. And so that makes the book ending a bit more unique, where Vic like is at peace, and he's happy to be leaving all these people who are so mediocre and who just conform, because Vic is very anti-conforming and being normal. And it does leave it up to you, like, we don't know what happens to Vic. And I do like, too, how the community looked up to Vic so much. In the end of the book, everybody will know the truth. <laughs> and so uh, that would have been kind of interesting to see how things played out after that. And before we wrap this up, I want to mention one change from book to movie. Like, there are some minor changes that I didn't mention. But a big thing from the book that's left out from the movie is that, as I said, Vic is a publisher and he has this guy who has a book of poems that he's having published. And so this guy whose name was Brian, he comes to stay with them for a few days to work on this book and decide how it's going to look when it's published. And he sees Tony hanging around too. And so he sees Melinda kind of as fair game and he starts being interested in her and they even hang out. However, they never end up having sex. But he's there when Tony suggests they eat the snails and he's all on board too, wanting to eat the snails, not realizing what they mean to Vic. And Melinda's like encouraging this because she is aware what they mean to Vic. But yeah, so that character was there for a bit and was kind of part of the story. But I was fine with the movie leaving him out because he didn't play a huge role. And to talk about book or movie, I was impressed with this adaptation and it does stay close to the novel. So I was happy about that. And even though it stays close to the novel and I knew what was going to happen, I was still very engaged and interested and drawn in. And I thought the performances were good, like specifically Anna de Armas, Ben Affleck, and Gracie Jenkins, who plays Trixie. I thought the three of them were great. And all the side characters. Also, uh, Tracy Letts as Don, I thought was really good. He was very dislikable and annoying, which is what he's supposed to be. And yeah, I thought it was interesting that the movie kills him off. I'm still kind of conflicted on both the book and the movie endings. Ultimately, I gave the book four stars and I would give the movie three stars, I would say. So I guess that right there answers the question and the book wins. <laughs> But this was a really good adaptation, and so far on IMDb, IMDb, this has like a 5.7 out of 10. So it's not, it's gotten a lot of bad reviews, but I was impressed. It was better than I thought it would be personally, and so I really enjoyed it. And again, if you're into these suburban thrillers between husband and wife, then I think you'll really enjoy it. And I find those storylines to be intriguing, and marriage is such an interesting relationship, right? And it's so intimate, and so I... I enjoy suspense thrillers that involve that. Yeah, overall, I guess I'd recommend the book more than the movie. But if you've read the book, I think you would like the movie. And yeah, I guess that wraps it up for today's book first movie. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and to like this video and to comment down below your thoughts on the movie and if you've read the book and how the two compare. And again, I did leave out some of the minor changes, like for example, him seeing the $3,000 being paid to Charlie Delisle for piano lessons and him having to like, do his detective work to find out about Charlie. That wasn't the case in the book because she was very open about Charlie and he didn't have to figure out what was going on. But yeah, so there's just some little changes like that, but I covered it, the bigger ones, specifically the ending, which is the biggest of all. Anyway, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel if you're interested in book first movie comparisons or book collection videos, because that's the other main video I do is showing off my book collection. Thank you for listening to this and or watching this video and I will see you next time, bye.